Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I love Ed and Jan's story. If you missed part one, that's available online on the church app. I would encourage you to go listen and watch. It's a great, it talks about how they met each other at Moody and how God called them to Bible translation. But a couple things just to make sure you heard. Did you catch what Ed said? It used to be a life's work. They spent 25 years translating the language, the Bible into one language, the Tabata language. Now you can do for 10 languages in two years what it took a lifetime to do for one. All they need is the resources. That's why we're doing this. So again, I would encourage you. I also love that the chicken thief becomes a Christian through Bible translation. That's so great. And you hear what Ed said? When the gospel of Jesus came into their own vocabulary, that's when transformation happened. I love that line. So anyway, if you feel led to do that, we just want to thank you in advance for your generosity to making that happen. We want to celebrate as we hear more stories about that, what God's doing. A little review on our series. If you're new or haven't been tracking, maybe you were, you were in Mexico last week. The rest of us resent you, but welcome back. And you forgot what we're doing. We're in a series called Jesus of the Prophets, where we're looking back through the eyes of the Old Testament prophets as they looked forward in hope to who, to who the Messiah was, how Jesus fulfills that hope then and still does for us now today. Uh, just a little review. Micah, we started out with the prophet Micah about the, one, the, the future king who will return. But our longing for a great leader. You know, we have election season coming up, which is... Maybe you maybe don't want to think about that. But either way, we long for a leader to set things right. And Micah talks about this, how Christ fulfills that longing. And then Hosea, the strange story about Hosea with an unfaithful wife and how God uses that story to tell us how his love for us is, while well, we're unfaithful, he pursues us even when we run from him. And then Zechariah, this ancient story about this imagery of a courtroom in heaven where there's an advocate standing beside us to defend us against the accusations of the accuser before God. And then last week from Isaiah 9, we heard your Pastor Brian talk, that's the one we usually read at Christmas time, right? We read about the child who will be born to reign and rule. It has those amazing four names, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And when you start putting these prophecies together, there's over 400 specific prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah. When you start to read these, you realize that the, the incalculable odds of one man in history fulfilling all of these prophecies. It's really astonishing. Speaking of incalculable odds, any of you fill out an NCAA bracket this year for March Madness? If you did and you submitted to NCAA.com, they've been doing this for about 10 years now. There was one guy for the first time in their history who got to the Sweet 16. 49 straight games, perfect bracket. And he, he, it, his bracket was ruined when Tennessee lost in overtime. I thought that was funny. Anyway, went to Purdue, no, no less. But that, that's only the Sweet 16. I did a little more reading on the, on the NCAA.com website, which is not really sermon prep, but it's making its way in here anyway. Uh, and the story that they said, the, the odds of getting a perfect bracket, anybody know what they are? 9.2 quintillion, my man, Eric, you got that, right? So, which is a number that's hard to grasp. One quintillion is a billion billions. One, one in 9.2 quintillion, if you had a 50-50 shot of every game. So just, just by way of illustration, here's one of the, the mathematician's illustrations. If, if, I, if, if there's four trillion trees, give or take, on planet Earth, if I placed one acorn in one of those four trillion trees and gave you one chance to pick one tree and climb up that tree and find that acorn, your odds of getting that acorn tree right on the first pick would be 23% better than your odds of getting a 64 team bracket perfect. Which is, it's hard to believe that's true. Mathematician Peter Stoner calculated the odds, and some of you may have read this in a book called The Case for Christ, the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight only eight of the 400 specific prophecies about in the Old Testament. It's one in 100 quadrillion. So better than the uh, NCAA bracket. But that's only eight of the 400 prophecies. And he illustrates it this way. He says, if you covered the state of Texas three feet deep with silver dollars, and then I put a red dot on the underside of one of those silver dollars, I blindfolded you and said, start walking from Lubbock to Houston, right? <laughs> And you just start walking across the state. And you can stop anytime you want, bend down blindfolded, and pick up one silver dollar. The odds of you getting the one with the red dot on it are the same as Jesus Christ, one man in history, fulfilling only eight of the 400 specific messianic prophecies. I say all that to say this. When we read Jesus of the prophets, sometimes it's easy to forget how astounding this stuff is. How absolutely astounding it is. Hundreds of years before these prophets are looking forward in faith, to what God would do in one man. So let's look at Isaiah 53. That's our text for this morning. 
A uh, little bit background, Isaiah lived at a time of the coming, um, slightly before, but he's looking forward to what would become the Babylonian captivity. So Assyria, the empire of Assyria, has already marched on the northern kingdom. If you don't know your Old Testament history, here's a crash course. Israel, as a nation, was divided into two halves. Northern kingdom called Israel, it's confusing. Southern kingdom called Judah, where Jerusalem was. The northern kingdom has already been ostensibly wiped out. Israel is... Assyria has conquered the northern kingdom, and they're threatening the southern kingdom. That's the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is, is the last holdout of God's people in the promised land. They've had corrupt kings, they've rebelled against God, and things have gone from bad to worse. And Isaiah's living at a time when, slightly before, the Babylonian Empire, who is the next power after Assyria, will come destroy Jerusalem and take two-thirds of the population away captive. That's what's about to happen. So people being threatened from the outside, and people that are corrupted on the inside. In some ways, it's a very relevant time. In a sense, I think Isaiah 53, which we're about to read, is God's answer to what's wrong with the world and what's God going to do about it, or what has he done about it. All right, Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, while they had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous. Then he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. I'm going to guess that some of that passage is familiar to you, some of it maybe not so much. This is one of four poems that Isaiah writes in the latter part of his long book, his prophecy. Sometimes these poems are referred to as the servant songs, four poetic songs about the servant of the Lord. And this is the last, the fourth in this series, called The Suffering Servant. Now, traditionally, traditional Jewish interpretation, not Christian interpretation, but traditional Jewish interpretation of these songs or poems about the servant is that Israel itself, the Jewish people, are the servant of the Lord. They are the ones that are God's servant on earth. And so when they read this, they interpret it that way. However, interestingly, the fourth poem, the one we just read, Isaiah 53, is not included in synagogue readings today. They leave it out. They avoid it. In fact, many Jews don't know, have much familiarity with this text. Why? It's curious why that is. I think, in a way, Isaiah anticipates it. We'll call this an unbelievable message. An unbelievable message. All right, look at verse 1 again. Isaiah is actually saying this message about a suffering servant is going to be hard for people to believe. They're going to struggle to get it. Listen to what he says. Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who's going to believe this, he says? Who is going to believe this? Now, this phrase, the arm of the Lord, is important to understand. Sometimes it's easy to read through this stuff, and and we just skim right by because we're not Hebrews. We don't have the background. Uh, The arm of the Lord is is a euphemism, a Hebrewism, for the strength and power of God to save in history. 
So you know, like the mouth of the Lord is God's will being spoken. God speaks and things happen. He, 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 he creates the universe by a word of his power. God's eye is the knowledge of the Lord, that what God sees and knows throughout the earth. And when you hear the arm of the Lord or the hand of the Lord, that's a reference to God's saving power actually in history. Psalm 98 verse 1, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His hand and his mighty arm have worked salvation for him. There's lots of references like this. God, the Israelites said, by his arm parted the Red Sea and delivered Israel out of slavery in Egypt. So what's Isaiah saying? Who is going to believe that this suffering servant, this one who people despised and rejected, who wasn't very attractive, who, who was tortured, who's going to believe that guy is the arm of the Lord? Who's going to believe that guy is the one, the saving power of God in history? That just doesn't make sense, and many people are going to miss it. And it's true. It was true then, it's true today. In fact, in John chapter 12, verses 36 to 38, we find out this is exactly how the disciples came to see Jesus for who he was. Verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. When Jesus said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? <laughs> Isaiah prophesied it, the disciples experienced it, and it still goes on today. It still happens today. In fact, I want to show you a video of a Jewish man. He's a, he's a Messianic Jew. He's a rabbi who's come to be faith in Jesus. It's about two minutes long. Uh, his, name is, his name is Moshe Mote Abelson, so it's a fantastic Jewish name. But he talks about how Isaiah 53 helped him in his own process and journey to faith. Let's, let's watch what he has to say together. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible, this is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father, um, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults, and he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months, and uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York, and he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand, <laughs> would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. That's a segment of a longer clip where he tells his story. I love what he says. I tapped into a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. But it's a truth, Isaiah says, that many missed and still miss today. Even the disciples struggled with this. You know, in Matthew 16, there's this remarkable story where Jesus directly says, the Son of Man, referring to himself, must suffer many things and then be crucified. And Peter, this is his rabbi, his master, his Lord. Peter, what does Peter do? Peter does not say, well, that's kind of a bummer, but okay, if you say so. I'll... What does Peter do? Anybody know? Peter pulls Jesus aside and basically tries to talk some sense into him. Think about that. Jesus, all this death talk is bad for morale, man. Don't talk that way. Like, that's in my translation. Like, you know, why do you keep saying this stuff? Think about that. G Peter pulls Jesus aside, the Son of God, and says, hey, let me, let me try to talk some sense to you. 
I wonder how often we try to talk sense to Jesus about how we ought to be handling things, how we ought to be working in our lives, why he isn't doing things on our timeline and in our way. Can we just let him be the suffering servant and suffer with us? Isaiah says, who's gonna believe this? That this guy is the arm of the Lord, the mighty arm of the Lord. Okay, second, a rejected servant. One of the most striking things about this passage is how Isaiah describes the way the Messiah is going to be treated by those that he came to save, those he comes to deliver. Look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Who despised and rejected him? Specifically, who, who despised him and rejected Jesus? Well, the Jews did. His own people did. The Pharisees did. Even his disciples did. None of them stuck by him in his hour of need. Peter outright denied him. They all fled. And we do still today. John 1.11 says, He came to that which was his own, but his own people did not receive him. Luke 17.25, the, the, the Messiah, the, the Lord, must suffer many things and then be rejected by this generation. What's that generation? It's ours as well. It goes on. He is still despised and ignored. Romans chapter 1 tells us that we all turn away from Jesus. Now, I, I was thinking that you might be thinking at this point, which is dangerous, but, but you might, maybe you're thinking, like I like, were tempted to think, well, look, I, I know I don't always obey Jesus. I know I don't always understand him. I know I'm, I'm not always a good Christian, but I don't despise him. I love him. I, I don't hate him. You do, actually, despise and reject him, and so do I. Let me try to explain that. Despising and rejecting Jesus is refusing to see him for who he really is, to accept him for who he really is. Every time, then, you doubt his love and forgiveness for you, there's a, there's a despising going on. You're saying the cross isn't enough. I don't know if that's enough to forgive me. Every time you try to take back control of your life and question that he's in control, you despise and reject him. Every time you fear the opinion of other people more than you care about the opinion of the Lord in your life, you despise and reject him. Every time you withhold forgiveness from those people who deserve it or you don't ask for it, when you know how much you've been forgiven, you despise and reject him. Now, praise God that he doesn't despise and reject us back because his grace is sufficient, but I'm just saying, it's tempting to read this and think, well, that's not me. I'm a believer. I don't despise him. Actually, we all do in small and large ways. And then there's this phrase that says, as one from whom men hide their faces. Did you catch this? This is easy to miss. This is really powerful. What does that mean? Well, in, in, in the Old Testament, the face of God is symbolic representation of the blessing and favor of God in your life. For example, in Numbers chapter 6, there's the priestly, Aaronic priestly blessing. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. That face shine upon you is the Hebrew way of saying God's favor, God's love, God's goodness in your life. Moms and dads, when your kids were little, you ever grab them by the cheeks and say, look at me, when they're crying or they're sad or they're whatever, and you want to just tell them how much you love them, you know? If you do that now, when my son was 22, it'd be weird, you know? Grab them by the beard. <laughs> it doesn't work. But when they're little, you grab them, look at me, look at me, look at my face. Sometimes my kids do that to me. Daddy, they're trying to talk to me, you know? It's kind of like that. God is saying, I want you to look at me in the, now in, 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 the old, in Exodus, Moses says you can't look at the face of God and live, yet he longs to, and he said he's a friend of God who spoke to God face to face. So seeing God face to face is a way of like all his glory would wipe us out, but because of Christ, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wants to, you to look him in the eye symbolically and him to say I love you, pour out his grace and favor on your life. And we, are, we hide our face from him, it says. Like one from whom men hide their faces. Do you ever avoid eye contact with people out in public? If you're, how many of you have ever seen somebody and thought, oh no, that's him, and not looked at them? Anybody? If your hand's not up, you're a total liar or not listening. <laughs> Everybody's done this, right? Oh, he owes me money, or oh, she's, her sister's a jerk, whatever, I don't want to look at him. You think the thoughts, right? I remember, I've told the story before, but years ago, I, I've, I've, 
He was getting to know this guy, and he had all kinds of brokenness in his life, but Christ was working on him. And then the bottom fell out in his marriage, and he stopped coming. Wouldn't return my text, didn't see him for months. Saw him in Target, hadn't seen him in a long time. He looks up from across the aisle and sees me, and I see him, and he sees that I see him, right? And then you know what he did? He went, oh, and moved on. I felt so sad. I don't hate that guy. I love that guy. God loves that guy. But that was symbolic reaction of what we do with God, isn't it? When, when, when we messed up or, or our life has fallen apart, we avert our eyes from the one who loves us most. We look away. And I think there's a sense in which God is saying, if you're in Christ, why do you hide your face? Look at me. Look at me. I love you. I want you to know that. As one from whom men hide their faces, we're told. And actually, if you put it together with what we're told about Jesus, then there's nothing very attractive about him. I mean, he's not this charismatic, powerful, attractive leader. He's someone who's got nothing physically about him that would stand out, nothing that we would desire. In fact, he's rejected. He's suffering undeservedly. He's more like a street person in that sense. You ever been downtown and see somebody on the side of the road who's got the sign out? And you avoid him, you avoid your eye contact, you cross the other side, you go, oh no, they're gonna ask for money. That's probably closer to what it, who Jesus is and why men and women hide their face from him. Who's gonna believe that this guy is the arm of the Lord, the grace of God in action? All right, third, a wounded healer. There's, I honestly, Isaiah 53 is so remarkable, it's, it's impossible to get all of it in. We're just touching the highlights here. Um, the heart of Isaiah's prophecy is verses 4 through 6. I don't think there's a better place in all the Bible that explains what actually happened at the cross than Isaiah 53, particularly the center part of the text. Like, what, what did Jesus die for? What really happened there? I think Isaiah 53 tells us better than any place else in the Bible. Let's read verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now don't let your familiarity with these verses rob you of the power of them, if you've heard this before. I think it's the best place that talks about what's happening at the cross. This is the essence of Christianity, friends. The, the, the core of Christianity is not love your neighbor as yourself. That's true and that's good, but it's not the essence. It's not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's not love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those are all true things and good things, but they're not the core. The core is what's happening here. The core is this event, because Christianity is good news. It's not good advice. It's news about what has happened in history, what Jesus did, and why that matters. He was a great teacher, but he didn't come primarily to teach. He came to do something, to accomplish something, to suffer and to die for you, for me, for us. First John 4 verse 10 says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now, I want to talk some theology with you about that, that, that word, atoning sacrifice. If you follow Christian thought of these days, and maybe you don't, and that's fine, but if you do, the atonement, what the atonement really is, is getting a lot of um, questioning and re-envisioning and reimagining. And it's crucial if you want to be an authentic Christ follower to understand what happened at the cross and why that matters, why that's the whole thing for your life. Uh, in the ESV, it doesn't say, I read from the NIV there, in the ESV it doesn't say atoning sacrifice, it says the word propitiation, which is a fancy technical theological term, which I think it's better the NIV translate atoning sacrifice. But in atonement, two things are happening that we have to talk about. And I'm gonna give you two fancy theological words. Do you like theology? Who wants to go to school for a minute? Anybody? All right. So first, propitiation, the prefix pro, meaning it's for, in the place of. Propitiation is dying for, suffering in the place of. And we see that in verse 5, don't we? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's propitiation. You're supposed to be there. He takes your place. He's punished where you belong. The second word that's part of atonement is the word expiation. 
The, the prefix ex is, to, is um, removal of. So in verse four, which we didn't read, uh, at least this time earlier we did, surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. So two things happen in the atonement. One is he suffers for you, paying the penalty, punishment for you. The second thing is he takes away your guilt and sin. Propitiation, dying for. Expiation, taking away. Both happen at the cross. And this goes back to Leviticus 16, where there's this long chapter on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There's instructions about what's supposed to happen in the temple at the Day of Atonement. There are two goats, and the priest would cast lots for, the, for which goat was going to get the short end of the stick. Because the, the, the lot that fell to the first goat, that goat would be sacrificed on the altar as a sin offering. Every part of it burned up. That's the bad draw if you're the goat. The second goat was called the scapegoat. Some of you might know about this. And the scapegoat, the Azazel, is, was sent outside the camp, sent away from the people of God. Only after the priest did something, placed his hands on the goat's head and confessed the sins of the people symbolically onto that goat. And then the goat leaves the building, right? Outside the camp, symbolically taking away the sin. You see what's happening there? Propitiation, dying for, expiation, taking away. But that happened every year, over and over and over again, right? It's a symbol. Isaiah is saying, the mighty arm of the Lord is coming, who's going to do both of those things once and for all. He's going to die in your place, pay the penalty, and he's going to take it all away. It's unbelievable. It's easy to miss, but it's unbelievable. The wounded healer. We have this tendency to think of sin as something outside of ourselves. Like it's not... You know, we do bad things, we make bad choices, we say bad words, we think bad thoughts, but you know, it's not really us. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, 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 I had the extenuating circumstances. I had a bad day, I didn't sleep well, I had some bad chili, you don't understand how my sister is, I didn't mean to do that, right? It's not me, I just did those things. But that's not how the Bible sees sin. The Bible sees sin is not the compounding effect of all your bad choices that are outside of you. It's a virus that's in you. It's much more serious than just bad things you do, bad thoughts you think. Listen to what verse 6 says. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the essence of sin. Now you hear, we're like sheep. Oh, okay, I get it. We're helpless, but we're cute and cuddly and fluffy. That's not the image. It doesn't say we, like lone wolves, get to define our destiny and go our own way. It says you're like sheep. I read an article about 1,500 sheep in eastern Turkey that went off a cliff, one after the other. They follow one rogue sheep off a cliff, 1,500 of them. Sheep are dumb, and sheep are directionless, and sheep are defenseless. 404 of the sheep died. Do you know why the other 1,100 didn't die? Because they landed on the pile of 400 fluffy sheep at the bottom. I'm, just, I'm not making this up. This is true. They survived. Just off the cliff. Apparently, the shepherds fell asleep or something. The Bible says you are like sheep that go astray. And we laugh about that story, but the truth is we follow each other off spiritual cliff after spiritual cliff over and over again. I see it all the time. We go our own way. The essence of sin is I'm going my own way. There's either a God who made you in his image and, and loves you and therefore has rightful claim over all of your life. You belong to him, whether you want to admit it or not. Or there's not a God who made you in his image and therefore do what you want. Go your own way. It's not going to burn up when the sun burns out anyway. What does it matter? But if there is a God who made you in his image, then he owns you, whether you want to admit that or not. And the essence of sin is saying, no, there's not. I'm going my own way. This is what Jesus came to deal with, what the servant came to suffer for. Now, in verse 7, we're told that he was oppressed and afflicted, and he doesn't open his mouth, meaning this is the one who comes out of the Jordan River, and God says, behold, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Don't you think he has the right to say when he's on the cross, I thought I was your beloved son. This is what I get? He doesn't open his mouth, doesn't protest once. Why not? Because he knows what it's for. We read that the father, it was his will to crush him. What? It pleases the Father. Why? 
because he knows what it's for. This is what he came to do. In John 10, verse 18, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to pick it back up again. And I got this authority from my Father. This brings the last point, a living Savior. I think the clock is faster at Mill Creek than it is at Kesslinger Campus. <laughs> Verses 10 and 11. The Lord has, uh, um, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When a soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul shall he see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Okay, I'm just going to skip down to the, kind of the, the punchline here. Look at verse 11 again. Keep that up there. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. What does that mean? I've been thinking about that this week. Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the garden, he says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. He has anguish of soul out of that deep pain. I think the worst kind of suffering in life is the kind that feels purposeless, don't you? Meaningless, like what is the point of this? But for the Christian, ultimately speaking, there's no such thing as meaningless pain or purposeless suffering, even though it might feel like it at times. There's no pain, no matter how severe, that the suffering servant cannot redeem, has not redeemed, and will not ultimately use, though he does not cause, will not ultimately use for your good and his glory. That's what Isaiah 53, 11 means. Out of the anguish of his soul, the deepest pain, he'll be satisfied. How? The next part, because he will see many made righteous. That's you, that's me. He knows what the suffering is for. I'm just gonna leave you with a couple thoughts here. I don't know that there's any better assurance of God's love for you than what we're reading right here. Paul puts it like this in Romans 8, 32. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You hear that? If you're struggling to believe that God loves you and has forgiven you, and you're secure in that, that's, this is the greatest assurance you can have. The one who, who did not spare his own son, but gave him for you. You can trust him that he's gonna graciously give you all things. Maybe not in your time or in your way or according to your agenda, but you can trust him. Or if you're still striving to, to be good enough, Isaiah 53 is saying, it's done. He did that. The gospel's not about what you have to do, it's what Christ has done. Believe it. Or, if, you're, if you wrestle with knowing the, what God's purpose is in suffering, his promise to you is not that he'll tell you every answer right now, but two things. One, that you're not alone in it. He suffers with you as he suffers for you. And two, that ultimately speaking, he will redeem it. Though you may have to be the other side of eternity to see that. I, I, there's so much more in Isaiah 53 that we could unpack. We have, to, we have to close now and we'll finish by singing together A Man of Sorrows. I know it's late, but it's a good song. Come on, come on, Eric. Come on, let's sing it. <laughs> let's pray as the, as the band comes. Father God, you, you are so far beyond our comprehension. And this ancient prophecy is so relevant and powerful for us if we'll just open our hearts and minds. But Isaiah tells us, who's going to believe this? Help us to believe. Help us to be ones who see that you, Jesus, are the mighty arm of God acting in history to suffer and die in our place, to take our sins away, to give us hope for eternity, to bring meaning into our lives even when we suffer, and to assure us that you will graciously give us all things. We thank you, and we praise you from the bottom of our heart. Amen. Amen.